Hey guys, what's up? Welcome to part 2 of this new series where I'll be covering what I consider to be the best battle system in every JRPG franchise. Alright, let's begin! I want to get the Sino series out of the way first because it was just so damn hard to choose. Every saga has its own unique system so comparing them feels interesting and out of place at the same time. I'll start by discarding the Xenoblade battle systems for a short number of reasons. They're great and enticing, especially the one in the first game, but as a player, half of the time you're barely doing anything. All you gotta do is make a choice every now and then and that's it. Not the case with the bosses though, but the random battles feel like filler most of the time. I think these battle mechanics are still awesome, but they can be somewhat hollow in my opinion. My main problem is deciding between Sino Saga and Sino Gears, specifically Sino Saga 3, as I believe it took everything from its predecessors, perfecting the right and destroying the wrong. But these games, they have two types of combat modes, the fights with the human characters and the ones with the mechs. That's where my indecision comes in. You see, for the human battles I chose the battle system in Sino Gears. Each character has several combos as their regular attacks, so it's amazing to see how your normal attacks can be often replaced by these special skills called death blows. I also think the penalties surrounding them are fair enough. Each type of attack costs action points, so pursuing or changing the combinations is a lot of fun. Also, characters have ether and different magic styles, but nothing that really stands out of the regular JRPG systems. Dead blows and later in the game, elemental dead blows are where the real fun is. However, the gear battles aren't as fun as the human ones here. Battles are also played in turns, but dead blows are restricted. You gotta first build the attack level to execute them. Also, instead of action points, gears use gas, and if it runs out, you need to charge. It's still a good system, don't take me wrong, but somehow I always felt it was a bit of a chore. Similar restrictions are there in the mech battles during Sino Saga 3 alright, however, the interface is much faster and better, penalties aren't that annoying since they do not occur as often. Depending on the weapon equipped, the types of attack will be different, there's an energy level, similar to the fuel or gas thing in Sino Gears, but more resilient. Plus, there's the anima mode, the more you attack, the more its bar fills up. When you reach it, attack power increases and energy costs for actions are lowered. So you see, the gear battles in both games aren't all that different, but I felt it was smoother, friendlier and simply more engaging in Sino Saga 3. Human battles in that game also have an amazing interface, and the boost feature that you can use to act twice in a row, nowhere near as convoluted as the one in Sino Saga 2. It's a great system, and honestly, I loved it as well, but it doesn't stand out that much compared to the dead blow combos in Sino Gears. So in conclusion, Sino Gears has the best human battles, but Sino Saga 3 has the best gear battles. Most of the Legend of Heroes games are turn-based RPGs, and each arc has a different variation of the system. It's an evolution that started back at the early 90s with Dragon Slayer and still goes on today with Hajimari no Kiseki. From regular first-person turn-based, to top-down view influenced by positions, fleshed out with some small grid-based elements, to continue with Trails of Cold Steel, now more based on area of effect actions and limited ranges. So which arc has the best battle mechanics of them all? I'd say the system in Cold Steel is the best. There's four games and each one got better over time, so it's safe to assume Steel 4 has the best of them all. A big extra that influences my decision is the fact that you can play with several different characters from previous Trails games, but that's just me being a fanboy. The battle system in this game revolves around four characters that you can switch for others at any given time if they're in your reserve party, of course. You can make the formations in the menu to position your characters where you think it's best for the start of each battle. Once it starts, you will only be able to move them during their turn. This plays a key role in this combat as some enemies can have a nasty area of effect attack. 
but so can you, which means the more enemies in your attack range, the better. There's all sorts of elemental magics involved, buffs and debuffs that also help break the battle system, and regular skills based on CP. These are points that fill up the more you attack or receive damage, but you have to consider they are also used for the special crafts. Those are usually big area of effect attacks that do massive damage to your enemies. If you have more than 100 points, you can use one at any given time, even interrupting the flow of battle. Trails of Cold Steel 4 also has an Orders feature. Every single character can use one even if they are not in your active party, but as long as they are in the reserve party, you can use them as well. They're mostly buffs or debuffs that can heavily influence the battle flow in your favor. Last but not least, the chain attacks. Two characters can be linked together and perform a combo with these, as long as they can break the enemy first or do a critical attack or exploit the enemy's weaknesses. They can also help each other out when in trouble. The more you use these chain attacks, the more the BP bar fills up, until it's enough to do an all-out attack like in the Persona series. Now, just like the first scene of games, this quadrilogy also has mech battles. The same system carries over during them, which are slightly different, but overall they play out by the same rules and advantages. Although the chain attacks are mostly individual instead of linked, and each mech can have support by a human character acting separately with their own turn. See how awesome this system is? It's a fantastic evolution from all the good elements in the previous games, which is the reason why I personally think it's the best combat system in the entire franchise. Star Ocean is a small series that's only spawned 5 main games so far. So what is the best battle system out of these 5 releases? Let's compare first. Star Ocean 1 and 2 had a battle system in 2D, generally with the characters starting at the right side of the screen. These were 2D sprites in 3D environments, and I admit these systems, especially the second one, were pretty much awesome. Along came the third game, now in full 3D, but with wacky controls and strange combos. I got used to it after a while and ended up loving it, by the way. But take most of the things that were wrong with it and fix them. The result is Star Ocean The Last Hope. I think that one has the best battle system of the series, regardless of what you think of the story. Say what you want about the plot and the characters, this video is about battle mechanics. For starters, it isn't convoluted and clunky as its predecessor, as much as I enjoyed it, I have to admit it's quite unbalanced. In The Last Hope, balance came back and difficulty progression was there. A couple of ways to enjoy this system even more were the rush gauge and the blind sides. The former were individual attacks to surprise the enemy, also used to perform a special ability. This makes battles more engaging simply because you can strategize your attacks carefully to do more damage. The blind sides were kinda tricky but very useful, especially in some boss battles. Let them target you, have them miss by quickly moving around them, or position yourself out of their line of sight. If successfully achieved, you counter and launch an attack with massive damage. Last but not least, it's worth mentioning you can choose how your characters will act in battle through a variety of fighting styles. It's called Beat, Battle Enhancement Attribute Type. It's like an evolution from the previous Star Ocean games done right. It works just fine actually, which means your ally AI in this game is quite helpful and responsive. Only gripe I have is the camera. It can move in and out in quite the obnoxious way sometimes. Now, Star Rush Until the End of Time only had 3 playable characters during battle. Thank goodness The Last Hope returned to 4. And you know what? I at least didn't have any trouble whatsoever getting used to most of them. Each felt totally different yet pleasant to control. I got my way around the game with characters like Edge, Raimi, Sarah and even freaking Limo! When you have a battle system like this, where almost everything works fine, you really start enjoying it to its fullest. It may not be perfect, but it's definitely the best out of them all. Wild Arms is a series that started off with regular turn-based battle systems. They were decent, playable and enjoyable, with a good interface. Back then the first game stood out for the use of arms the Gonjir character uses to attack. Once they run out of ammo, you need to spend one turn to recharge. There was also the use of magic and skills, bound by a bar that you needed to fill up. My point is, these three games had a neat battle system, but today it just doesn't stand out that much. 
Wild Arms 4 was totally different and it introduced a clunky or rather a beta version of this hex system. Your characters could move around hexes one per turn to influence the elemental terrain in battle. It was original and innovative but it didn't reach its epitome until Wild Arms 5, my pick for this video. Now, the idea of adding a little spice of strategy to the games was mind-blowing for me. It tore down a lot of fans I know but it had the opposite effect on me. Perhaps because this was the very first Wild Arms I ever played? So I was introduced to the hex system. Some hexes have no element, which means everything is possible. You can also stand in them without taking advantage of the effects. But moving on the elemental hexes is where the real strategy of the game counts. Characters and foes alike can often stand on them, and if they attack each other with the element stronger against the one they're standing on, they do more damage. Normal attacks, however, are the same no matter where you are. But using them stacks up the force meter. This one will help you into creating awesome combos between your characters or even special attacks, some including the summoning of guardian beasts. And let's not forget that certain accessories let your party members perform chain attacks or even consecutive attacks. This battle system is simply superb, and it also carries over elements from the first Wild Arms like the need to use a turn to recharge your weapon if it runs out of ammo. Plus, Wild Arms 5 feels more western-like than its predecessor, especially considering its gun shenanigans performed by several party members. Overall, it's the best one in the series in my opinion, and the last one of its kind. Let's talk now about one of the most underrated series of all time, Crow Lancer. Just like with Wild Arms, in this case I do have to go with my favorite in the series, but of course, I'll share my reasons why. There are 6 games in this franchise, but we only got 4 of them, so it's not gonna be that hard to compare them. Grow Lancer, Heritage of War, also known as Grow Lancer 5, has the best combat of them all. Now, every single title in the series has a real-time strategy system. Characters have attack and move waiting bars, just like the enemies, but it all happens with no turns whatsoever, which means battles flow in real time, as the title implies. As the player, you need to strategize on these battlefields, to select where your characters will move, considering the terrain, the enemy number, the enemy type, and your different playable allies. You also need to select their actions to whatever might be more convenient for that particular small amount of time. One. Just one second can completely change things upside down for either you or your enemies. However, in these older games, you were stuck waiting for every action to be carried out, while constantly pausing the game to redirect your characters or to select a different command. Well, guess what Girl Lancer 5 does with this system? It lets the player freely control their characters. No more forcefully setting the destination, you can just move your character on your own to get it closer to the enemy. Action is fast-paced here and not clunky and primitive like the other older games, because as much as I love them with all my heart, I gotta admit they play like PlayStation 1 games, Girl Lancer 5 totally feels like a PlayStation 2 RPG with better controls, faster interface, and full-screen menus to carefully select your actions. The map and mission design give this game a huge extra point, how most of them have different objectives with very intelligent design in the setting and layout of every single battlefield. So it's the epitome of the Girl Lancer battle system. Like most JRPGs, characters have a skill tree and the more they fight, the more points they'll get to unlock new abilities. Which ones to use or abuse plays a major role here because magic and skills can turn the tide of battle in your favor. In a nutshell, Girl Lancer 5 is a hybrid that mixes real-time strategy with action. I guess similar in a way to Final Fantasy XII? Anyway, masterpiece of a game and its amazing battle mechanics are a big reason why I picked it over the others. Some amazing games here and my choices align with some of my personal favorites in each franchise. Remember, this was part 2, so there's still more JRPG series to be covered. Thanks for watching and see you on part 3.